Isaiah 9, verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, there are some in this place today who are desperately in need of a wonderful counselor. And we pray that you would speak counsel to their hearts today. There are some who are in need of a, a mighty God. They need you to show yourself mighty on their behalf. And our prayer is that you might do so. There are some who are in need of a father figure. Maybe they had a father who was anything but everlasting. But you are the everlasting father. And undoubtedly there are those here who are in need of the Prince of Peace. Father, we pray that even in this moment that the peace that passes all understanding would come to them, whatever they're dealing with, whatever hurt they're dealing with, whatever anxiety they're dealing with. Let your peace rest upon them. Teach us now by your word and by your spirit. It's in the name of Christ we ask it. Amen. If you remember from last Sunday, we began looking at the greatest gift of all, the gift that God gave when he gave his son Jesus to us. We said last week that it's a multifaceted gift. It's a gift of such incredible nature that mere human words could never plumb its depth, depths nor describe its worth. But using the word of God, we're, we're looking at this marvelous gift from a variety of perspectives. We saw last week our need of the gift. And we saw that Jesus is the universal answer for the universal ailment of sin. And he's universally available to all who will call upon him for forgiveness. Today and for some weeks to come, we're going to think about the magnificence of the gift. I'm sure everybody here at some point has heard the term white elephant gift. We all know what a white elephant gift is. A white elephant gift is a gift with little or no value. And many times around the Christmas season, different people will have white elephant parties where, they, where each person brings to the gift exchange a gift that is broken or useless or just plain ugly. And such gift exchanges can be uproariously good fun as each person opens a hilariously bad gift. But it seems that the actual derivation of that term white elephant gift has a far more sinister origin. It seems that in ancient Persia, the Persians considered albino elephants white elephants to be sacred. And the king of Persia came up with an ingenious but wicked way to get back at a subject who had displeased him in some way. With great pomp and circumstance, he would publicly present that offending subject with the gift of a white elephant. Because it was a gift from the king, the subject could not refuse it. Because it was a gift from the king, he could not give it away. He could not sell it. He had to keep it. And because it was sacred, he could not kill it. He could not neglect it. He could not work it in any way. The only thing he could do with it was take care of it for the rest of its life. The cost of caring and feeding a full-grown elephant, as you can well imagine, is a considerable expense. And when the king gave a subject a white elephant, he was Sentencing that subject to a lifetime of poverty for himself and his family. 
Some gifts, it seems, are not worth having. But the gift of Jesus, now that's a gift worth having. That's a, a gift worth having. A, the gift of Jesus is a magnificent gift. Here in Isaiah 9, in the same passage in which we saw our need of the gift, Isaiah speaks to us about how magnificent this gift is. That this gift from the ultimate king is not some burden with no benefit but rather it's a benefit of inestimable, inestimable value that lifts our burdens. So let's notice first of all this morning that the gift is phenomenal in its satisfaction. The gift is phenomenal in its satisfaction. It says, and he shall be called wonderful. And he shall be called wonderful. I'm sure that all of us at some point in our lives have received a wonderful gift. Or maybe we've made a purchase that we were extremely well pleased with, something that we absolutely loved. It exceeded all of our best hopes, and we were eager to show it off. We were eager to brag on it. We were eager to recommend it to others. But then there's the other end of the spectrum. A gift or a purchase that turned out to be a bitter and terrible disappointment. I remember when I was 15 years old, I got braces on my teeth. I had to wear those braces on my teeth for five days short of one year. And during that year that I wore braces, freshen up chewing gum came out. How many of you remember that? That's the gum with the liquid center. And I've never been much of a gum chewer, but I was fascinated by the ads for that gum. It, it, they said that when you popped that thing in your mouth and bit down on it, it was an explosion of freshness and flavor. And I it was eager to try it, but mom and the orthodontist had both said that chewing gum with braces was absolutely forbidden and being the ever obedient son and the poster child for medical compliance... I put off till the day I got those braces off chewing freshen up gum. But the day I got those braces off before I drove myself back to school, I drove myself to the nearest drugstore. I walked in, I plunked down my dollar. I got a package of freshen up gum. I knew I couldn't chew it at school, so I'd have to chew it on the way. And I went back to my car, and I unwrapped it, and I popped that thing in my mouth. One of the biggest disappointments of my life. It must be. It's th been 37 years. I'm still talking about it. When I bit down, it didn't explode. It just kind of oozed. And far from being an explosion of freshness and flavor, to be honest, it's kind of nasty. And I spit it out. And I threw away the rest of the pack. And to this day, I've never chewed another piece of freshen up chewing gum. What a disappointment. Back when I was a kid growing up in Savannah, Georgia, until 1970, there were only two television stations. There were three if you count PBS, but who counts PBS? Two TV stations. And what that meant, among other things, is that at 7 o'clock on Saturday night, you could watch anything you want as long as you wanted to watch Hee Haw or the Lawrence Welk Show. Those were your options a strange confluence of musical styles, if ever there was one. If Dad was in charge of the television, there was no doubt that it was going to be hee-haw. If Mom was in charge, it just depended on her mood. Sometimes it was hee-haw, sometimes it was the Lawrence Welk Show. For those of you who are too young to remember the Lawrence Welk Show, let me give you a, an update so that you'll understand what I'm talking about. Lawrence Welk was a big band leader. He was from a German background, had a thick German accent. His band played big band music. His orchestra played polka music. And Not only did he have the big band, he also had members of his troupe. Some of them were dancers. Some of them were singers. Some of them were musicians of various kinds. 
And they had a variety show where those different performers would perform. And every time after one of those performers would perform, the camera would pan back to Lawrence. And Lawrence would always say the same thing. Wonderful, wonderful. Never once, not even once in my entire childhood did the camera pan back to Lawrence. And with his best Simon Cowell sneer, did he say, terrible, terrible. That was dreadful. That was just awful. No, it was always wonderful. Wonderful. During this time of the year, oftentimes you'll hear an announcer saying an advertisement, it's a gift everyone would love. Or perhaps you'll hear it put like this. It's perfect for everyone on your shopping list. But I would say to you, there is no product or gift that everyone would love. As someone who's been horizontally enhanced for most of my life, I can tell you that one size does not fit all. And listen, even if one size did fit all, it certainly wouldn't suit all. There's no garment that everyone would love to wear, just as there's no musical artist that everyone would think is wonderful. Tastes differ. And the hee-haw crowd and the Lawrence Welk crowd are evidence of it, but I can assure you of this, nobody who has ever received the gift of Jesus has walked away disappointed. Nobody who's ever truly received the gift of Jesus has been disappointed. I've never had anybody come back to me and say, Brother Donnie, I wish you had never led me to the Lord. I wish I had never become a Christian. But I have had people come back and say, I wish I had become a Christian years before I did. I wish I hadn't had to go through some of the things I went through before I became a Christian. I wish I could have known Jesus earlier and longer. See, Jesus meets and exceeds every expectation. He is wonderful. Life in Him is wonderful. His blessings are wonderful. And listen, that's just here on earth. Heaven will be even more wonderful. His name is wonderful. We call Him wonderful with every song of praise we lift up to Him. We call Him wonderful with every minute we spend in His presence. We call Him wonderful with every effort we put forth in His name. We call Him wonderful whenever we brag on Him and encourage others to receive Him through our witness. Wonderful, wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. There's no disappointment. There's no shoddy workmanship, there's no letdown, and there's no false advertisement in God's gift. His gift is phenomenal in its satisfaction. Secondly, notice this morning the gift is our proponent in life and living. He's not only wonderful, he's the wonderful counselor. Now there are a couple of ways we use that term counselor in our culture. If you put those two meanings together, they pretty much sum up the meaning of the Hebrew word. One use of that word counselor is, refers to an advice giver. Someone who gives us direction and helps us navigate through the difficulties of life. Counseling is a huge industry in our culture. There are pastoral counselors and licensed therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists and life coaches and career counselors and they all have their place and their function and sometimes they're needed. But I would say to you this morning that the best counselor of all is Dr. Jesus. And the best earthly counselors are those who point us to Him. When we live by His Word, talk to Him daily, listen to His Spirit and walk in His will, He shows us how to live the abundant life. Life that brings glory to Him, blessing to others, and fulfillment and satisfaction to ourselves. A second use of that word counsel refers to an attorney. A lawyer who's well versed in the complexities of law who can navigate us through those legal waters when we have a legal problem. Listen, there's a reason why when you're arrested you're immediately offered an attorney. 
Because without knowledge of how the court system works, without knowledge of how the legal system works, most people would not know the ins and outs of the law or the protocols of the court and would quickly find themselves in a legal quagmire. I remember years ago watching on court TV the highlights or lowlights of a trial in which a man had been accused of walking onto a subway train and opening fire with a handgun. And beginning of the trial, he dismissed his attorney and insisted on acting as his own attorney. The judge tried to talk him out of it, but he insisted and it was his legal right and it was an absolute unmitigated disaster. Over and over again, the judge would reprimand him because he didn't understand the court procedures. He didn't understand the protocols of legal procedure. And when he did get a chance to talk and examine the witnesses, his ineptitude just dug him ever deeper into a deeper, darker hole. I remember one particular exchange. He asked a witness, he said, when the gunman came on the subway car, what did he do first? And after the person had answered that question, he said, then what did I do next? Folks, I can tell you this. If I'm ever on trial, if my life and my liberty are ever at stake, I don't want to go in that courtroom alone. I want the best attorney that money can buy. Every single one of us faces a court date with the great judge of all mankind. And listen, it's not our liberty or our lives that's at stake. It's our eternal souls that are at stake. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go into that courtroom alone. There are some who will face that court alone. There are some who will insist on acting as their own attorneys. Jesus talked about them. They'll come presenting their good works and appealing to their good works and try to get off from the sentence that is hanging over their head by appealing to their good works. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name do many miracles and in your name cast out demons and Jesus will say to them, depart from me you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. There are others who will try to sway the court with all of the excuses that they've used throughout their lives for why they wouldn't come to Christ. Oh, I would have become a Christian. I would have come to Christ. But there's so many hypocrites in the church. I would have become a Christian. But some Christian hurt my feelings. I would have come to Christ, but the church hurt my granddaddy back in 1957. And on and on and on with excuse after excuse after excuse as if the eloquence of their arguments is somehow going to sway the mind of God into violating His own word. But one day when I walk into that courtroom, and I stand before that heavenly court. And the charges are read. The wonderful counselor is going to be standing there with me. And he's going to say, Father, he's guilty as charged. But when he was a nine-year-old boy, on Friday night of a spring revival, at South Gardens Baptist Church in Savannah, Georgia in 1971. He responded to an invitation to receive me as his Lord and Savior. He understood that he was a sinner. He understood that he deserved nothing but death and hell. But he understood that I died on the cross for his sins. And he received the gift that I offered to him. And he surrendered as much as he knew of himself to as much as he knew of me. And Father, even though he's guilty of every, every act that, that on the list against him, that sin's already been paid for. I paid for that sin on the cross of Calvary and he's already been pardoned and at that the doors of heaven are going to swing wide open for me. Not because of anything I've done. Not because of any righteousness that's in me. But because of my wonderful counselor. 
and His precious blood that plead my case for me. What about you? What about when you face that day? What about when you stand before that all-seeing, all-knowing judge? Will you come before Him bearing your good works? Will you come before Him giving lame excuses? Or will you come before Him accompanied by His precious Son as your attorney? I don't know when that day may come for any of us, but I do know that only those who are clients of the wonderful Counselor get into heaven. The only provision that God made to save sinful human beings from hell and to bring them to heaven is Jesus. It's only by repenting of our sins and placing our faith in Him as Lord and Savior that we can be saved. So what about you? Have you received Him as your Lord and Savior? If the answer to that question is no, why won't you receive Him right now? I'm going to ask everybody, if you would, bow your head, close your eyes. Nobody moving around, nobody looking around. This is a time for, for you and God. Today, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you may think, well, I, I can't come to Jesus. There's all kinds of things in my life. Listen, you don't quit bleeding to go to the emergency room. You don't get cleaned up to take a bath. And if you've got sin in your life, if you'll let Jesus in there, he'll clean it up for you. You may be saying, well, you don't know what's going on in my life. I don't have to know what's going on in your life. He knows what's going on in your life. And he says, come unto me. He says, anybody who'll come to me, I will in no wise cast them out. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not whosoever's got their act together. Not whosoever's got everything nailed down. Not whosoever is turned over new leaf. Not whosoever whatever. Just whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You need to call upon him today. You need to pray and ask him to come into your life. I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. If the prayer does not represent the desire of your heart it's just empty words but if the, de if, the, if the desire of your heart today is to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior you need to pray something along these lines dear Lord Jesus I know that I'm a sinner I know that I've done things that are displeasing to you but right now I turn from my sins and repentance I place my faith in you and what you did on the cross come into my life change me make me the kind of person that you want me to be and I'll do my very best to live for you every day of my life. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. Everybody look up at me for just a moment. If you just prayed that prayer, you just asked Jesus to be Lord of your life. First thing he asks of you as Lord of your life is that you confess him publicly and then that you follow him in New Testament baptism. We're going to give you the opportunity this morning to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The way we do that is as we sing our closing hymn today, I'm going to be standing right down front here. You need to step out wherever you are. If somebody's between you and the aisle, they'll get out of your way. But you need to step out, walk one of these aisles and come forward. Say, Brother Donnie, I've asked Jesus to be Lord of my life. And I'll present you to the congregation. We'll celebrate your decision. And then we'll set up a time when you can be baptized. It may be today that the Lord is working on you about some other matter in your life. You may need to come and pray at the altar. You may want to come and have me pray with you. Maybe today that the Lord is speaking to your heart about uniting with this church. And if that's the case today, we invite you to come if the Lord is leading you here. However the Lord may be dealing with you today as we stand together and sing, Jesus calls you now. Won't you answer him? We stand together and sing.